Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 175. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons. And as always, I'm joined by the effective man himself, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. Yeah, this today is all about habits. It's all about getting into one of our really popular top 10 listeners' favorites. I'm pretty excited to revisit this space. How about you? Mark, I, I think you've undersold it. I think we're going to an all-time personal transformation classic. It's the book, the playbook of being effective. Mark, what are we diving into today? We are digging into Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, Mike, I mean, you might remember, as I'm sure our listeners do, Stephen Covey has seven habits of highly effective people in this book of his. But in this particular episode, we dive into the first three. And those first three are really orientated around self-mastery. And I think that's fair to say it's pretty on par and, and in line with the moonshots uh, moonshot series, don't you think? Self-mastery? Yes, I, I would say that self-mastery may be the meta theme of this entire show, being the best version of ourselves. And we love doing it together and learning out loud. And there is nothing better than hitting a bit of Stephen R. Covey. And the crazy thing is this book is written decades ago and it is massively popular with you, our listeners. It was one of our all-time most popular shows. It's huge on Amazon.com and it speaks to the timeliness of these rules, philosophies, whatever you want to call them, seven practices of highly effective people. We're starting with the first three. I might go as far as saying, Mark, that these might be my favorite uh, ones from the book. The other four, we'll have to wait and see till we uh, regroup and rejoin and uh, reflect on that show. But oh my gosh, a whole show dedicated to concepts of being proactive, starting with the end in mind. So kind of reverse engineering from the objectives that you have, working out how you want to get there. And my personal favorite, Mark, is putting first things first. Oh my gosh, there's so much in this. I I want to know from you, which of these three, Mark, really speak to you? If you could call out for our listeners, hey, Tune into one of these three. Which one is it from Stephen R. Covey? I, th- I think Stephen Covey begins his seven habits with the habit that speaks the most to me, which is be proactive. Now, we've covered this framework and this way of thinking uh, a couple of times, Mike, in the Moonshot Show, as well as our master series. And be proactive is all about the circle of influence. And I really enjoy the way that Covey breaks down those different circles of reactive versus proactive things, things that you can focus on, things that you can't focus, uh, things that you can't control, uh, but you're allowed to complain about. I really enjoyed the, um, I guess the confession that a lot of us get distracted by allowing things that are not in our control to Mm. take up a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of emotions within our day. It's very easy to get distracted and go down a path that fundamentally doesn't really matter. And I really like the habit of being proactive, which then allows me to really focus on, okay, well, if this is going to have an effect on me more so than this idea over here, maybe the opinions of others, maybe politics, maybe it's the weather, then I can actually (laughs) refocus my attention into attitudes, skills, uh, enthusiasm or hobbies that then I I get a lot of more mileage out of. So for me, as Mm. I think about self-mastery and being the best version of myself, being proactive from a mindset perspective makes a lot of sense. Which habit was standing out for you within this series? Look, Mark, I'm quite partial to the be proactive, Um, you know, this idea of choosing how you want to respond to circumstances. You may not control events around you, but you certainly do control how you respond. I like it. I'm into it. But I'm, and I'm quite partial to a little bit of reverse engineering saying, hey, you know, if I want to get there, what do I need to do to make that uh, come true? But putting first things first is huge for me. It's huge for me because I work across a lot of things. So prioritization is like the art of a busy person. 
But I would also say that when I reflect on people that I work with, people that I meet, I see a lot of people who are swamped Mm. with emails, notifications, things to do, and I don't think they're highly effective. I think they could be so much better if they had the capacity to use the tool that Covey talks about in this show, the difference between urgent and important, using the Eisenhower matrix to manage your time. This is what is just so powerful about the work of Stephen R. Covey. He really helps us through that process. And so, Mark, today I'm so excited that we're going to dig into these three key habits of one of our all-time titans, classics, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective by Stephen R. Covey. Mark, are you ready? Yep, Mike. I think we've set it up perfectly for our listeners. Let's get into it. So this first clip, this introduction to Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is a great little synopsis on how the personality as well as character ethics are quite different. And this is a great little synopsis from Wisdom for Life. Now, this book has touched millions of people's lives. It's one of, if not the most well-known success books out there. There are literally thousands of success books out there. So why should this one be any different? Well, Stephen researched the last 200 years of success literature and found something quite interesting. In the last 50 years, most of the books have been focused on the personality ethic. Things like public image, how you dress, how you perform in social interactions, positive mental attitude, skills and techniques to get people to behave in certain ways. These books focus on how to appear rather than how to actually be. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People takes an inside out approach. It focuses on the character ethic rather than the personality ethic. In the words of Stephen Covey, almost all the literature in the first 150 years or so focused on what could be called the character ethic as the foundation for success. Things like integrity, humility, temperance, courage, and justice, patience, industry, simplicity, modesty, and the golden rule. The character ethic taught that there are basic principles of effective living and that people can only experience true success and enduring happiness as they learn and integrate these principles into their basic character. You know, greatness starts from the inside out. Of course, there is a place for personality ethic, but character forms the foundation. Personality ethics need to be rooted in character. The personality ethic can be seen as fake or as a fake it till you make it image if it's not rooted in character. Sometimes people apply these personality techniques in order to use and manipulate people to meet their own goals and agendas. In the long run, people will eventually see through this duplicity. But you can't fake character ethic. If you're still a little fuzzy on this concept, picture an iceberg, right? The personality ethic is above the water. The character ethic is below the water. It forms a foundation. It's where the greatest impact over the long term is. It's where you sow the seeds of greatness. The seeds of greatness. Oh my gosh. Mark, you didn't warn me that we were leading with such a heavy first clip. I mean, I I mean, we could stop the rest of the clips and just talk about this for the next hour. Oh my gosh. I mean, isn't this interesting that Covey reminds us to return to virtues? of true character, which, I mean, this must have Ryan Holiday like nodding furiously in agreement. I mean, this is so profound in getting back to your true values that will inform how you behave and avoiding the mistake of trying to be a personality, a persona you think you should be. And this for me was... When I relate to this personally, I think one of the greatest things that has changed as I think about my career and actually far beyond it is that learning and understanding and reminding yourself of what you believe in and then just being yourself, if you will, the character and the personality alignment there. Stop trying to be a personality or a persona that you think is expected of you in your roles, whether it be at work or in life, but go back to the fundamentals, be in touch with those values, remind yourself of them, live by them, 
And as a personality, one of my biggest breakthroughs, and I'm, I've by no means mastered this, is to be the true person you are. Don't try and be the person you think others expect or just to please people or to win people over. It is so great that just in the introduction to this book, we just uncover this huge idea. And so what I propose to you, Mark, is how with such a big idea like this, how do we kind of come back to our character, this foundation? How, how do you stop falling for the trap of just that personality fix that we heard from Wisdom for Life? Yeah, it's, it's tough, isn't it? And it's going to be, um, I, I imagine something that a lot of our listeners have to contend with day to day as well, because we are naturally, I think, raised into this, this uh, almost emulation culture. You know, we see a lot of inspiring people all around us every day Mm -hmm. and it's very easy to think, Hey, I kind of want what they have. I want that car or I want to be confident, you know, it can be both emotional as well as, as physical, can't Mm -hmm. it? the the need or the desire to have that that personality ethic as as Stephen is is referencing but i think something that is is really valuable is exactly what you've just said it's the ron holday approach it's thinking from a stoic perspective and thinking okay well what actually makes me happy is it being a nice guy is it being caring for other people is it being considerate and you know it could be something as simple as holding the door open what gives you that small little smile yeah. that only you can give yourself. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Something, you know, when you, when you make a difference in somebody's life, maybe you pick up their dropped umbrella or their phone mm. and they say, Oh, thank you. That was really, really helpful. That's a very small, I think, character driven behavior that perhaps only yeah. you would do in that sort of way. So what I would propose is the way we can f- remind ourselves or even discover what our character really is I think first one is it's you've got to read a lot, don't you, Matt? Yeah, that's true. Right, that's true. You've got to you've got to introduce new ideas to provoke your own thoughts. Well, does that sound right? How do I relate to that? How might I do that? And I think the second thing is, and I think this again, another big breakthrough for myself. You've got to write about it. You've got to journal. You've got to you've got to manifest uh, these things. It's all very good and well to say I'm going to work hard but you've got to write it down and you've got to do it every morning or every evening. You've got to like go to the the mental gym and build that muscle, that commitment, because then it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? Yeah. As, as even Stephen himself is going to call out later in this, in the show, it's one thing to say you're going to do Mm. it. You know, you're going to learn in, in today's, um, in today's episode, we're going to dig into three of these habits, but there's going to be seven in total. And it's one thing to say, oh yeah, great. I understand them. I know what Stephen Covey's mm-hmm. talking about here, but it's another thing to put them into practice, isn't it? Well, the great news is that uh, we've actually got this next clip, which is from, um, from Covey's son. And uh, this is uh, Stephen M. R. Covey, um, the son of the author of the seven habits of highly effective people. And he's going to do something very important for us. He is going to give us a sense, the meaning you might say, of this whole idea of being effective. If we're going to be effective, we need to understand what we mean by highly effective. It could be efficient people or it could be even successful people, but the term is effective. And I use the story of Aesop and the fable of the farmer who is down on his luck and is terribly poor, and then he finds a goose. And to his delight, this goose, the next morning, has laid a golden egg. And he's thrilled because it's truly an egg of gold. He's able to sell it, gain value. And then the next day, he lays another golden egg. He's thrilled again. And then the next day, another golden egg. And the goose is continually laying these golden eggs, and the farmer is absolutely delighted and thrilled. And then after a several days, he becomes increasingly greedy, and he wants all the gold all at once. And so in his effort to get more gold faster, he kills the goose, reaches inside to get all the gold, and realizes there's nothing there but a dead goose. So he's just killed the goose that lays the golden egg. We use this 
this fable as a metaphor. And we hear it all the time. The goose that lays the golden egg. That's what we mean really by effectiveness. It's really a combination of both those things. The goose and the golden eggs. The golden eggs is our performance, our production. When we produce and perform, then we're being effective. But it's not enough just to produce and perform if we don't have a healthy goose that will lay these golden eggs. And so it's always then also, in addition to the performance, the production, it is the health, the maintenance, and the well-being of the goose. And there's many organizations that sometimes can drive for results and get the production, get the golden eggs, but they do it in a way that diminishes, and in some cases even destroys the health of the goose. And over time, the goose gets sick or even dies. Sometimes the same thing happens with us as individuals. We might drive hard for results, get them again and again and again, but do it in a way that destroys the health and the welfare of our, of our goose, so to speak, where we become less effective and over time lose our effectiveness or die altogether in our ability to produce. Now, clearly, the other side is true as well. If someone only um, has a healthy goose and never delivers the golden eggs, that's just potential. We're not delivering. Real effectiveness is that balance of production and production capabilities, the golden eggs as well as the goose. Oh, two big intro clips to set us up for today's show. Mark, Mark. we're never going to get to the actual seven habits because the intros are too (laughs) good. I know. I really enjoy that Aesop fable. I think that's such a good, relatable uh, tale, isn't it? Again, I mean, this is why we're in the Timeless Classic series, Mike. (laughs) You don't know whether, uh, do I explore this on a personal basis? Because you could easily see that that allegory being not only for people, but for companies and organizations, you know? And and isn't it uh, interesting that the idea of the goose that lays the golden egg, how pervasive that is in business culture, understanding, you know, your point of difference, your unfair advantage, or on a personal basis, like what, what you see is this relationship that if you're not healthy and well, you know, healthy body, healthy mind, you know, it's so fascinating. You can see this on so many levels. I mean, it, it just speaks to the power of the work from, from Covey, this, this seven habits of highly effective people. It's, I mean, we can't even get to the clips markets that good. <laughs> we're still, we're still in the intros, but I think both of those two clips that we've just heard are setting the scene for the, our next couple of shows, Mike, um, because we now understand this idea of effectiveness. We're not necessarily focused on efficiency. What we're trying to find is how do we balance the production so maybe the eggs, mm. as well as the production capabilities, i.e. the goose. How do we maintain that equilibrium? Because if you wait too much on the actual production piece, or you're going to start to lose track, or even um, as, as Stephen Covey's son puts it, kill the goose. Mm. And by not finding your core um, character-driven ethic, this from the stoic point of view, really being inward facing and reflecting on yourself, you're not going to be able to, I think, balance that uh, equilibrium correctly because fundamentally your production output and your capabilities are intrinsically tied to your ability to understand yourself and be the best version of yourself day to day. Well, I think we better jump in or, or, or else we could find ourselves just jamming on these, the first two, two clips for the whole show. And that would be rather disappointing for all of our listeners. So let's kick this off. Let's go to this idea of uh, habit number one. And it's all about proactivity and not reactivity. But what's really fascinating is there's actually lots of ideas deeper inside of this that you may have heard of. So let's start by listening to Covey himself talking about this idea of being proactive. Now we want to look at the foundational habit, habit one, to be proactive. Why foundational? Because all of the other habits flow out of it. If habit one is present, you can cultivate the other six. If it is not present, you will not cultivate the other six. Habit one, be proactive, basically means 
that your life is a product of your values, not your feelings. That your life or the organization's life is a product of your decisions, not your conditions. The opposite of being proactive is to be reactive, which basically means that your life is a function of your feelings, your moods, your impulses, other people's treatment. The underlying principle of habit one, be proactive, is to take responsibility. The concept is you and I have the capacity to choose our response. If you don't believe that you're capable of choosing your own response, if you don't have that vision of yourself, if you're deep into victimism, I'll just about guarantee you, you will become disempowered. You will not begin with the end in mind with careful thinking about the future. You'll be a function of the past. You will put second, third, fourth, and fifth things first with your ladder leaning against the wrong wall. You'll think win-lose or lose-win. You'll always seek to be understood first rather than to understand. And you'll be constantly botching all kinds of relationships because both parties feel misunderstood. Ego battles will develop. At best, you'll end up with compromise instead of synergy. And you will not take the time to sharpen the saw because you simply don't have the time to get gas. You're too busy. You're buried in the thick of thin things. That's why habit one is so foundational, so basic. It is the vital foundational component of every other habit. What a perfect place to start with Stephen Covey essentially laying out the next seven habits. Uh, yeah. It's, he said it's the the precondition to the other six habits is you got to get, be proactive, right. But it's more than just like, you know, go after the day and be on top of things, isn't it? Oh, it's so much deeper. This is a fundamental shift in the way that we think. You cannot go after the other six habits and be highly effective unless you get this first step right, unless you essentially learn to think or learn to walk, I suppose, in the right way. And this idea of being and thinking proactively is pretty fundamental, actually, Mike. And it's something that I think maybe some of our listeners will relate to, because for me, at least, I've probably found myself in a reactive state more than once in my life. Reactive being... um, happy to complain about circumstances, Mm. happy to say, Hey, well, it's just the way things are. I can't change. And it's very surface level, isn't it? It's very immediate as opposed to what Stephen's telling us here, being proactive, take responsibility and ownership of your own reactions, your own decisions and responses to a certain problem. And go out and make that difference. Owning that mm. moment of decision, I think, is is really fundamental to this idea of being proactive. Yeah, lots of parallels here with um, Ryan Holiday's work, isn't there? A lot of, of uh, collaboration, uh, sorry, consistency with Ryan Holiday, as well as, I'd say, um, Dale, how to stop worry. Yeah. You know, yeah. how you reframe yeah. your mindset. So I think... Um, In a moment, we will kind of deconstruct what we call that circle of influence, like the things you should be focused on, the things you should be proactive about owning. Um, But, Mark, let's call out some of the things. Let's remind ourselves of what we uh, shouldn't be worrying about, Um, this circle of concern. There's stuff like politics. Uh, Yeah, a classic one is, oh, you know, business is going to be tough. The economy is really bad after COVID. That's another good one. What else do you Mm -hmm. see that people preoccupy themselves with, which they have absolutely no control of? So there is like no point in worrying about. What else do you see them doing? The biggest one that I think is consistent in a lot of these other um, innovators and, and lessons that we've learned together, Mike, is what other people think of you. Right. 
right? You can't control what other people, uh, how they respond to you, how they interpret your actions or what they think of you. I think that for me, this idea of other people's opinions, it's so easy. I think we covered it in Gary V, the episode as well. We did. It's so it's so easy, isn't it, to get caught into a, oh, I'm really concerned about what so-and-so thinks. I think, that you stop- yeah, I think our ego wants, you know, everyone to love us. But I'll, I'll go even further. What I think is perhaps equal to that uh, in this circle of concern that Covey is saying, do not focus on these things. Let's be clear. Do not go is, um, what I see is a lot of judgment and blame in organizations towards others who supposedly didn't perform or haven't done their job. And people can get really uptight and spend a lot of energy focusing on the mistakes of others. Don't they? Yeah. I mean, it's very easy to, uh, instead of working at uh, creating a solution to the problem, finding where you can point the finger. Right. right? And, you know, the interesting thing to, to use some of Carnegie's insights and blend it with Covey, he's, he's just like, it is a total waste of your energy because it achieves no gain. Worrying about the economy, politics, what people think of you, the mistakes of others, the opinions of others, there, there is no net gain for, for that consideration. So why would you dedicate your time, energy and effort to that topic? I think all you're doing is wasting energy that could be diverted into your circle of influence, Mark. And there's a lot of goodies in there. Yeah, I mean, just a few circle of influence ideas that come to my mind, Mike, is, uh, you know, it starts with your attitude. Mm-hmm. This is what exactly be proactive habit number one is talking about. Your attitude and your response to um, challenges or opportunities. I think other ones that might be are the skills that you can learn. You know, you mef- referenced earlier, Mike, uh, one of the great traits is to pick up a book and be continuously learning. Mm-hmm. I think that feels as though it's something you yourself can control, right? Yeah. And, you know, what Covey was pointing out is this idea of victimization where people say, oh, the world is conspiring against me. It's terrible. It's awful. Poor me, poor me. Well, you may not control some things, but you do control your attitude, how you learn, how you think where you put your energy, the routines, the rituals, the habits that you have. And all of these can serve towards you being the best version of yourself. Because think about it. You might be facing uh, struggles, challenges, problems. And if you were Yako Willink, you'd say problems are opportunities. Or even more so, we've got a problem. He just says, good, right? Good. good. I can't really do a with you. Good. Um, So the point here is like put your energy where you're going to get something back, where you're going to get a return. And that is, okay, the problem may suck, but let's move on. Let's have a growth mindset. Let's embrace the challenge. Let's see problems as opportunities. Let's learn. Let's grow. And I think this is really important to remind ourselves, particularly when we've had a time in 2020 where so much happened around us that we're not really in control of, is that you have to divert your energy towards the things you do control, that circle of influence. And that's where you can be doing things every single day that are part of your purpose, why you're on the planet, why you're doing the things you do. So you might not have you know, achieved the end outcome. But the fact that you know that you are learning things every day, you're adopting the attitude and the enthusiasm and the habits, the atomic habits, if we think about James Clear, Mm. that will get you to the destination. So even though you don't have the, woohoo, I've made it, you have the, woohoo, I'm doing the right things to make it. And I think this is the power of habit number one, be proactive from Mr. Covey himself. Yeah, it's really all about, acting rather than being acted upon, I think, isn't it? It's, it's taking that first um, step and letting your um, conditions drive you rather than the other way around. Do you remember that story Holiday um, told? Was it Edison who said, quickly go get your mother, she'll never see a father Oh, I love like that. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was Edison and uh, it was in our, our fourth Ryan Holiday episode. And 
that was a wonderful story of just accepting the situation. Edison's factory is burning down, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment all going up in flames. And what does he do? He can't do anything about it. He can't put it out single-handedly. So he just stands back and watches. Enjoys the ride. Yeah. And that's, that's really the payoff to this, to this habit, isn't it? Um, because when you accept that there are things in the circle of concern that you can't change and focus your effort on what you can influence yourself, you're, you're on the right track and you get positive energy back. You can still move forward. You can still grow and be the best version of yourself. Now, we've mentioned a lot, this idea of like where you're going to like the end destination and you have to enjoy the journey as well. But there's lots of questions and choices, lefts and rights as we go along. And this, this next clip, it really talks about um, the second habit from Stephen Covey. This is all about, uh, you know, beginning this journey with the end in mind. Where do we get our sense of who we are? Where do we get our sense of what our life is about? Is it not from social mirrors, parents, siblings, teachers, leaders, the media, heroes, models? Isn't that possibly the case of a mistaken identity? Think about it. Ask yourself. Where do I get my knowledge of myself and what my vision in life is? What is it that I am really about? What is truly important to me? In habit two, begin with the end in mind is a clear and powerful declaration that you are the guardian the protector of your identity, of your future. In essence, habit one is the awareness that you are the programmer. It's the budding awareness that the best way to predict your future is to create it. Habit two decides what your life is about. And everything would flow from that. Every decision, large and small, would be a function of that. Not only what your identity is, but what your purpose is. What is your vision of what your life is about? You are the programmer, then write the program. You are the programmer, write the program. I think this is kind of just saying to me, Mark, don't take guidance or knowledge of yourself from anyone but yourself. Right. Don't let the opinions of others or the success of others really drive what makes you happy because fundamentally you are, as Stephen puts it in that clip, you are the programmer. You program yourself, your mindset, your reaction to these to these moments. And legacy is really what he's sort of nudging at here. And this came up with Clayton Christensen's book, How Will You Live Your Life? And w- there's a bit of Jim Collins in this as well which is, you know, beginning with the end in mind. And the, in the book, there's a really um, sort of uh, disruptive question that he asks, which is what will people say at your funeral? Now, I know that sounds a bit dramatic here for our podcast, but if you just uh, just go with it for a second, it's a very good question. And, um, you know, if... Everybody who listens to our show, all you moonshotters, we know that you want to be the best version of yourself. So let's all take this test. How many times have we not just thought about, but how many times have we written down what the end is? You know, if Kavi is saying, begin with the end in mind, what will be said at our funeral? How will we be remembered? What is our legacy? Now, here's the challenge. How many times have you not just thought about it? How many times have you written down your legacy? Because if that is the end goal, this should tell you 
how fine-tuned you are, how aligned you are today with who you want to be tomorrow right up until the end. Who do you want to be? What are they going to say at your funeral? What is your legacy? I mean, this is really powerful. And I think most people will find they have never written down what they want people to say at their funeral, right? Oh, I, I can't imagine many of the people that I know uh, who have done that because it's, it's a pretty confronting and pretty, um, you know, sensitive topic, isn't it? Because I think the very act of writing down what you want people to remember about you, what you want to leave behind, what you want people to say about your funeral, it exposes any of your existing insecurities. You know, oh, if I have not achieved this uh, concept, so I, maybe I want to be remembered for, I don't know, um, being a being a great guy, then I might call into question, hey, but am I a great guy? And this is exactly what Stephen's talking yeah. about, isn't it? By forcing yourself into the act of writing it down, visualizing and mm. thinking about it, only then can you expose those uncomfortable moments and you think, okay, well, am I? I mean, I got a little bit grumpy last week. You know, will that damage my um, eulogy <laughs> from my friend who's going to say that I'm a great guy at the wedding, at the funeral? And I think that's a really valuable habit, isn't it, Mike? This act of actually physically writing it Yeah. Down. And I will go one further. This is just a practical tip because we're all learning out loud together here on the Moonshots podcast. I even go back not only to journaling on it, I actually have a whole series of mantras of which one of those, the opening one, is my purpose. Mm. And so I will repeat this. I will write this. I will listen to it. So I've even recorded all of my mantras so that sometimes when I'm, you know, walking to a meeting, jumping on the train, going for a walk, I will listen to those mantras to remind myself of who I want to be and how I'm going to get there. And I, I think what's inside of this is you will only in the end be the person that holds yourself accountable to your dreams and your visions and your hope. And you know, I don't want to be too dramatic about all of this, but in the end, nobody else will hold you accountable to what you dream of being other than yourself. It will be on you. So you may as well get a bit uncomfortable, right? Take, a, take some advice from Joe Rogan, embrace the discomfort and really ask yourself, holy smoke, you know, am I building the legacy that I wanted to leave for the world? And think about mm. what that will mean to the people that you really care about. And I think this is ultimate accountability. It's a little bit brutal. It's certainly heavy duty for the Moonshots podcast, that's for sure. But I think these are fundamental questions that unlock our potential. I think that's why we want to go there, Mark. That's exactly why we do it, isn't it, Mike? We want to understand how we can dig that a little bit deeper into ourselves in order to be, maybe it's more effective. Maybe it's more patient. Maybe it's more uh, joyous in the way that we live our lives, but only by really digging into ourselves. And exactly as we caught out, at the beginning of this show, that inward facing look, very, very stoic. Can we begin to even uncover or scratch the surface of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that, Mark, we are, we are only through two habits of seven. Thank goodness we divided the show into two parts. But I think we, we really want to take this, this moment, Mark, to, to thank all of our listeners uh, from all four corners of the planet, they're all joining us to learn out loud. And Mark, I want to propose to you that one of the ways we kind of learn, and I mean you and me, is we learn from all of our listeners and we love it when they reach out to us, when they share ideas with us. So Mark, if our listeners are, are super primed, they're feeling very effective, right? Very, very effective uh, as they're listening to us. What is your invitation to them? 
I would invite everybody, every one of our listeners to pop on over to www.moonshots.io where you can find some of those mantras, perhaps, that Mike's been talking about. Maybe not the recorded ones. I think that, by the way, we should come back to that. That's a great little tip. But over at www.moonshots.io, you've got some of our written mantras. You've got all of our episodes, all 121 by the time that this one comes out, both past as well as uh, future shows that we want to try and do. You've got the ability to sign up for our newsletter, but also you've got an opportunity to leave us a little bit of feedback. Mm. We'd love to hear from you listeners. As Mike said, one of the ways that he and I learn out loud is by getting recommendations and insights from you guys. And one particular individual who I don't have their uh, name, so I I hope that they're listening and recognize the little story, but they got into uh, the Moonshots podcast by wanting to learn something about architecture and listen to the Frank Lloyd Wright episode and the architectural series that we got into. And now they listen to to us every morning, Mike. Isn't that, isn't that fantastic? It, it's great. And um, by the way, the Frank Lloyd Wright show was a bit of a dark horse um, out of nowhere, extremely, extremely popular. So thank you to all of you for listening uh, to not only the most recent and current shows, but also digging into our back catalog, which you can get at moonshots.io. And I want to send a special shout out to all of our new listeners in Thailand, because I don't know what's in the coffee in Thailand, but they're certainly getting into their uh, Moonshots podcast because we have catapulted up the charts in Thailand to, to number seven in business and entrepreneurship. So Fantastic. we really do want to welcome all our listeners in Thailand who have uh, they've trounced the Eastern Europeans. We were doing so well with Slovenia and Poland and, uh, you know, we had so much great love from Eastern Europe and Central Europe, but now it's the, the, the great uh, Asian wave of awesome Thailand uh, listeners is joining us. And we just want to welcome you uh, to somewhere here at the Moonshots podcast, where we like to learn out loud together to strive and to be the be- very best versions of ourselves. So, Mark, we've got a few more clips left uh, and stick with us because the next episode we'll do the remainder of Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mark, where do we go now that we have primed ourselves with being proactive, starting with the end in mind? What's next from Stephen Covey? Well, the first three habits are all around self-mastery. And Stephen Covey's idea of moving from dependence to interdependence. So we've heard about habit one being proactive rather than reactive. Habit two was about beginning with the end in mind. And now we're going to listen to habit three. Habit three is about putting first things first. And this is really all about managing ourselves more effectively, having the discipline to uh, prioritize our actions based on essentially what's important rather than urgent. And that's a really big fundamental shift that we're going to dig into. But this, let's listen to Stephen himself tell us a little bit about put first things first. In a sense, to use the computer metaphor, habit one is the awareness you are the programmer. Habit two is where you write the program. Habit three is where you run it. You execute around it. The third habit is put first things first. I'm going to try to teach an entirely new paradigm in the field of time management. Essentially, it is a paradigm or a way of thinking which focuses on relationships rather than schedules. The traditional paradigm in the field of time management has always dealt with time, scheduling, control, efficiency, doing more things faster. The paradigm is one focused upon efficiency and control. It's called time management. So you manage your time. The clock is the symbol of it. It drives us toward efficiency. Have you ever tried to be efficient with a loved one on a tough issue? (laughs) say with your spouse how did it go (laughs) have you ever tried to be efficient with say a difficult teenage situation how did it go 
You see, right off the bat, you and I know how foolish it is. But look at the paradigm that drives it. So what do we do? When it doesn't work, what do we do? We try to do it better, more efficiently. We try to be nicer. We try to be more positive. But the underlying paradigm, which is not questioned, of control and efficiency, and that we're right and the other is wrong, turns people into a thing. The paradigm I'm trying to teach today is one of a compass, based upon the sense of focusing upon the first things in our lives. And they're always relationships. The older one becomes, and the wider and deeper the perspective of a person's life is, the more relationships become the supreme thing. And the essence of all effectiveness basically deals with people with relationships. But these are governed by a moral sense of principles, of what is right and what is wrong, and of integrity around those. I'm asking for sufficient openness and humility to just get into this pair of glasses, this frame of reference, this new paradigm, this new map, based upon relationships, not schedules, based upon principles, not values, based upon leadership first, then management, based upon a compass, and then the clock. I am amazed that this is still such a relevant topic, Mark. I cannot tell you how many of my colleagues that I work with to help them understand the difference uh, between things that are urgent and not urgent, important versus not important. And I think the big struggle we all have right now is being so reachable, so interruptible that everything sort of becomes both urgent and important on this Mm. first things first um, tool. Some people call it the Eisenhower matrix where you have a, you know, uh, a matrix of what's urgent, what's important, and then you you kind of put things into the different quadrants. I think we might do that together in a second. But don't you think the battle we all fight is that we just have a mega list for today and that just consumes us so we're really not able to think about tomorrow, let alone think about, well, what should be on that list? Well, and, and isn't there's very few things that are as suffocating as having you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 items on your to-do list because you then don't feel aligned enough to know where to start. Mm. Where do I go? What do I begin with? How do I categorize what's the most important? Because I can work on any of them right now. Mm. So what do you end up doing? You do a little bit of each, (laughs) don't you? Yeah, or you start multitasking or you don't go deep enough. And, you know, talking about deep work, big nod to Cal Newport, what an amazing amazing piece of work that book was. But to bring us back here, um, if you are able, while we're chatting, um, definitely Google the Eisenhower matrix, because this is the the quadrant thinking uh, that Covey is talking about. But I think there's a, a, I think we should go into this a little bit deeper, don't you, Mark? Let's, let's explore, if we're going to put first things first, what is that? How do we do it, right? So I want you to all imagine that Step number one is to focus on, you know, really um, things that are have some urgency, time, and importance, meaning big impact. And so that might be pressing problems, you know, deadlines for projects, or maybe unexpected crises that you need to solve. What you want to do in that box is put things that meet that criteria because they have some urgency, right? they need to happen fast, and they they really matter. But you actually, now this is the beauty of the model, you want to reduce the number of things in that box so that there is only a few things there. And I think, Mark, we all struggle by putting too many things in the urgent and important quadrant, right? We all think that everything is a crisis, everything is urgent, everything is super important. And I think that's the big blocker, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, another few things that would jump out in my mind. Uh, big new business opportunities might come into that box. I think, um, like you say, crises, uh, any immediate problems, things that you've got that you feel like you just can't turn off. Yeah. You know, there's always going to be a lot of stuff. And there. if you don't um, minimize what's in that urgent and important box, I mean, you're just never going to, you're going to be like a hamster, right? Stuck in the wheel, spinning around, running around, no time to think about tomorrow. But I found the most powerful tool is to actually look at your calendar and schedule something that's not, it's not like super urgent for today, but it is really important to you is you use calendar blocking as an activity to schedule it in the future, something that you need to dedicate time to. Uh, on your current projects. But here's the other important thing. The other things that should go into that are proactive relationship building, um, planning for not just this week, this month, or this quarter, but starting to think about H1, H2 years. Start building roadmaps for yourself. Those things need time and consideration. You need to schedule those sort of things in, don't you, Mark? Otherwise, you just keep going through your daily list and that's it. Yeah. Exactly. And and you might tick off a couple of them along the way, but it's never going to be as efficient as if you dedicate time to getting them done properly, right? It's almost like this is this is the long-term box. This is the box of things that compound and create all sorts of value. This is the strategic box. This is the, I think where a lot of people let themselves down is they don't schedule, they don't appoint enough time for those really important things that are not urgent, right? Thinking about broader plans, plan Bs, um, thinking about purpose and, and, and legacy and all those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not the only two parts. Uh, there might be two parts, but that's not only what is in uh, this Eisenhower matrix of putting the first things first. There's two other parts to this mark isn't there and they're pretty nasty things this is where it all goes (laughs) this is where it all goes wrong i think this is the danger zone don't you yeah exactly and the other ones are really uh how you distinguish i guess is the right word mike or maybe identify the things that actually feel very urgent but aren't important Mm. at all and those things are are distractions. They are uh, deceptive, uh, as you as you called out in the Eisenhower Matrix. It's where we would call uh, the ability to delegate work or delegate uh, delegate items mm. really come into it. Such as those meetings that you think, oh, I've got to uh, I've got to uh, address it because it's at ten p.m today. Mm. Oh, maybe somebody else can go, oh, those emails, those calls that I keep on getting, how can I do the deep work that Cal Newport would recommend when I've just got to be online all the time responding to other people? Well, you know, the the common thing we find ourselves doing when we don't delegate is, oh, it will be faster if I do it, right? Oh, and look, I'm going to be totally honest with with you as well as our listeners. I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the 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 thing is that um, you will. So here's here's the insight: if you invest now in the delegation, you'll be much faster in the future because you won't need to do it at all because someone else will do it. You only need to train somebody right. once, right? So delegations is another one. Now here is. The fourth quadrant. This is where something is not urgent, nor is it important. So it might be a bit trivial, lots of time wasters. This is often maybe things that matter to others that have no relevance to you, but somehow you're getting roped into doing them. Now, we've talked about reducing in the top quadrant, scheduling for those more long term things. We've talked about delegating if it's urgent but not important. Mark, what do we do in this fourth quadrant? In the decluttering, I think it's just trying to not get too bogged down and spend all of your time at it, right? It's those endless no, tasks. I'm going to cha- Mark, that- Mark, I'm going to challenge you. No, not at all. Oh, really? Here we you? go. You okay. ready? Here's what you do. You say a magic word. No. No, I will not take part in that. That's yep. it. You have to eliminate trivial stuff, time wasters, that don't touch them. That's the whole point. And that's what when by putting first things first, last things, you don't do them. 
You don't do them at because all. Because they if the, look if you look use the formula, is it urgent? No. Is it important? No. Don't do it. Easy. Now, so here's the interesting thing. Because we're often, you know, humans are by default then nice and you find yourself saying yes to things you shouldn't have said yes to. But that takes you away from focusing on important and urgent things, which is part of your purpose, which will no doubt have a positive effect both for you and the people around you, the people you're serving. So see this as I'm saying no to this person so I can say yes to others. That's a very good way of reframing this, this so you don't feel like you're being you know, really nasty, but I'm sorry, I can't do that because if I was to do that, I would not fulfill my current responsibilities. Mm. Done. Done. It really comes down uh, quadrant two, you know, this idea of future planning and, and investing yourself in the long term. It's it looping us back to the habit two, isn't it? Begin with the end in mind. Yeah. Know where you're going, know what's important to you work on those relationships, work on yourself. And this is going to come into our next episode as well, Mike, mm. with some of the other habits mm. about building your own personal um, uh, sharpness, should we say. But it's, it's so valuable. Once you've got that really understood, once you know how to delegate or say no, you've suddenly opened up so much time in order to actually reflect and work on yourself. That's indeed the truth. And, and one, of, one of the things that happens when you've you know, really got on top of, you know, this idea of time management and prioritization is all sorts of possibilities, different roads appear to you. And, um, with all that comes good things. And so it would only be appropriate that we listen to Stephen R. Covey one more time talking about going down the road, less traveled. In conclusion, just remember this, everyone chooses one of two roads in life, whether they're young or old, rich or poor, men and women alike. One road is the broad, well-traveled road to mediocrity. The other, the road to greatness and meaning. The range of possibilities that exist within each of these two destinations is as wide as the diversity of gifts and personalities in the human family. But the contrast between the two destinations is as the night is to the day. A very teasing little outro there, Mike. You know, what's nice is Stephen's reminding us, you've just got to be that little bit bold, be that little bit daring, go after and down the road that's that little bit less traveled. Because once you've invested in these three habits that we've heard today, And next week, we're going to be digging into Stephen's other four habits of his seven habits of highly effective people. You can create that ability, that confidence, that durability to go down that road and live that life that's a little bit less travel. Yeah. And where do you think he's going with this less travel? Do you think he's distinguishing, you know, there's kind of two roads, there's sort of the easy road, but maybe less fulfilling. And then there's the, the harder road, but that's where satisfaction, legacy, fulfillment lays. Is that what you think he's pointing out here? Well, that's certainly consistent with some of the other work that we've done in the past. You know, you really get out of it what you put in when you listen to Joe Rogan, you've mentioned Yoko Willink. Um, You know, there's a lot of our individuals that would encourage us to go out and see obstacles and opportunities, for example, like Ron Hodley. I think what Stephen's also calling back here, though, is a reminder on the personality versus character ethic that we heard at the very beginning of the show. So rather than assuming um, everything's uh, very, very uh, rather than taking the easy route, which I think is what Stephen would now say is the public image yeah. approach, the personality approach, instead build on your integrity, build on yeah. your courage, and actually develop those character traits that are much more uh, resilient when you get on that road. Wow. That's pretty solid advice. And can you believe, Mark, we have only... Uh, decoded half of the book. I mean, it's remarkable, <laughs> isn't it? 
We did definitely need two shows. <laughs> Can you believe that we thought we could squeeze this into one show? That was, I know. What idiots we were. <laughs> what idiots. Well, we, we, well, it's just a reminder that this, this learning out loud um, journey that we can go on together with books as rich and uh, enjoyable as, as Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. There's so much to learn. You can you can relate it so well to your life now. I mean, we're in 2021. The book was written in 89, and there's still so many lessons that are completely um, relevant to us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I'm very curious looking at. Uh, everything we've discussed today, having now talked about them, which one uh, stands, is there one of these that rises above the others as being ooh, really helpful for you, Matt? I think the being proactive, not reactive. Stephen would call out that this is the foundational habit that you've got to get right before tackling the other six. And I'm, I'm going to take his side. Mm. I'm going to agree with him there. I think unless you've got that mindset correct, unless you can consider those different circles of concern and influence and get the balance mm. right, I, I feel as though you're always going to be swimming against the tide. Yeah, it's really powerful, isn't it? Because I think it's, I mean, I find myself falling into the trap of um, thinking, worrying about things I don't control. And it's it's a real discipline to bring yourself back into your circle of influence, isn't it? Oh, it's so difficult. I think it's, it's a practice that, as you've mentioned, you can build by journaling mm-hmm. that can bring mm-hmm. you back. You, you can have those mantras. I think that's a great idea as well as, uh, maybe even moments in your diary. Maybe you schedule 15, 30 minutes a day when you do consider, um, you know, a, a recurring, a, a, a recurring event mm. that says, Hey, are you being proactive or reactive? Yeah. You know, that's a little tip that that I think might be valuable. Well, what a rich tapestry we have woven together, Mark, you, I, and our listeners. It's uh, It's been just a delight to return to such a classic and to think maybe I thought to myself before the show, I've got everything I need from this book, but I find myself right now saying, Wow. (laughs) So Mark, thank you to you for sharing this journey with me. And thank you to you, all of our listeners, as we have gone on show 121 into the world of Stephen R. Covey and the seven habits of highly effective people. Wow. And this was only part one. But today we started with this notion of character and we made sure that we thought about protecting the goose as well as the golden eggs, taking care of ourselves so we can take care of others. And this journey started with the idea of being proactive and focusing on the circle of influence because you might not control the world, but you most certainly do control your reactions. Heed this good advice, all ye moonshotters. This is good stuff. But it gets better because we also learned that we should begin with the end in mind. What will be our legacy? And the way we make that happen every single day is by putting first things first. Have a very clear view on what is urgent and important. And if you do this, good things can happen. You will have the fortitude and the character to go down the road less traveled. And there at the end of that road, you will find indeed your own greatness. Well, that's it for the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.